you have your Bibles, 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, and I want to read the first four verses of 1 John chapter 1. Here's what it says, it says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed, what we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that life was revealed and we have seen it. And we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you may have fellowship along with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We're writing these things so that your joy may be complete. Have you ever hiked a mountain or climbed a tall hill and you get to the top and you look at the valley or um, the water that's below you, whatever's below, and find yourself just taken in by the immense beauty of what's before you? Have you ever walked outside on a dark, cloudless night and you looked up at the stars and you felt small as you considered the vastness of the universe that you were staring into? Have you ever been moved when you've seen a production or an athletic performance that just took your breath away? It was like, how is that even possible? Have you ever been present in a room when a child was born into this world? Have you ever felt the feeling of being in love with someone? Let me try this one. Have you ever driven down 75 or 635 and you look over and there's a woman that's putting on eyeline mascara and eating a bagel and talking on the phone at the same time in stop and go traffic? What I'm getting at is have you ever experienced a sense of wonder? A sense of awe? A sense of amazement? All of us, at some point or another, we felt like what it, we know what it feels like to be in wonder and awe. And I believe we were created for this. The Westminster Catechism, in its very first question, asks and answers this question, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is that the man's chief end, our main goal in life is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. See, if our chief reason for existence is to glorify and enjoy God forever, then we must have been created with this extraordinary capacity to wonder. What is wonder? To wonder is to be at awe of something, to be amazed by something, to be captivated by something, to be drawn into something, to get this sense that there is something bigger happening at that very moment. If you ever spent any time with children, you've seen what wonder looks like. Children are especially good at being in awe and wonder of different things. And there's something about having access to Google that causes all of our wonder and amazement to disappear from our lives. And maybe you're here this morning and you've lost the wonder of Christmas and the busyness of preparations lost the wonder of Christmas and the busyness of parties and the busyness of buying presents and the busyness of travel arrangements. Maybe you've been in church for a long time and you've heard the Christmas story over and over and the familiarity can almost cause this complacency to happen. And if we're not careful, we'll rush past the nativity and we'll plow through our holiday preparations, forgetting to make room for the one who we're supposedly celebrating and sadly, somewhere in the midst of the wrappings and the lights and the music and the food, we've allowed the holy to just become ho-hum and the miraculous to be reduced simply to the mundane. But what if there's more to the story? What if we're missing out the wonder of Christmas because we aren't paying attention to the details? This morning, I chose a particular text in 1 John chapter 1 because in a 
service, we could easily go to a text that describes the Christmas event. We could talk about a text that talks about the shepherd and the wise men and Mary and Joseph and the baby and a manger and a star that was in the sky. We could talk about all those stuff, and, but our text this morning isn't describing the events of Christmas, but it tells us what Christmas means. It doesn't tell us what happened. It tells us what what happened means. And I think in order for us to keep that awe and wonder of this season, we need to pause and just reflect on the meaning of Christmas. Why does this even matter? This little letter is a letter that was written by the Apostle John. This is the same John that wrote, wrote the Gospel of John, which we spent over 50 weeks studying. So you guys are very familiar with that book. He also wrote two other letters, Second John, Third John. And the section that we read is very similar to the first few verses of the Gospel of John. And what I want to do very briefly is just show you a few things through this text what Christmas means. See, it's very easy at Christmas time to actually think about, it's not to think about what this means. All you have to do is let nostalgia hit. You feel warm, you have memories, you get some time off of work or school, and there are many good things happening that make you feel good during the season. I want to just for a moment slow down and help us think about what actually Christmas means and what the Bible actually talks about the birth of Christ, the Son of God, the King of Kings, coming into this world, born as a human being, being in a manger. What does that mean for us? Just a couple things I want to highlight. Number one, if Christmas is true, then salvation is by grace. If Christmas is true, and salvation is by grace. Notice how John talks about Jesus here in our text. In chapter 1 of the Gospel of John, Jesus is called the Word. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And here, John says that Jesus is the Word of life. But look more carefully. The Word of life was with the Father from the beginning. That life was revealed, and we have seen it, and we testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life was with the Father. And listen, we're not being told here that Jesus has life or that Jesus gives life. And it's not just physical life. This is eternal life, salvation. It doesn't say he has it. It doesn't say he gives it. Here's one of the first things that we could say that makes Christianity different from every other religion in the world. In every other religion, the founder is a prophet or a sage. The founder says, here's the way for you to find eternal life. Do this, do that, do this, do that. And you will connect with the infinite and you will become one with God or you'll be saved. Do this, do this. This is the way to eternal life. But Jesus says, no, you don't do anything. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life, John 14. Christianity does not say that Jesus is a great prophet or a great teacher or a great sage that was alive to point you to God so that you could figure out how to save yourself. The Christmas story tells us that Jesus Christ is God who has come to save us and do what we cannot do for ourselves. To know him, friends, is to know eternal life. It's not like he comes and says, hey, follow me and you then live a good life and then God will bless you and then God will save you. No, friends, he is eternal life. And over the years, I've heard in numerous conversations um, with individuals, something that goes along the lines is like, you know, I don't know what I believe about Jesus or about the incarnation or about the death and resurrection of Jesus and all these other things in scripture because doctrine doesn't matter. What matters is that I go live a good life. That's what matters. But the truth is when you say that doctrine doesn't matter, that you just need to live a good life, friends, that's actually doctrine. And that doctrine is saying that, hey, I'm not so bad that I could do life by myself so well that I don't need a savior. That's the doctrine that you're proclaiming. I'm actually not so messed up that I can pull it together and live a good life apart from Jesus. I really don't need him. So when you say that doctrine doesn't matter, what matters is that you live a good life, that's, that is doctrine, and that's called the doctrine of salvation by good works rather than by grace. See, if you say doctrine doesn't matter and I just need to live a good life, then you'll live a life that's either characterized by fear and insecurity because you never know when you're good enough. You'll never know when you've done enough to be accepted. You'll never know when you miss the mark. Or you'll be marked by pride and disdain because you think you're good and you look down on others who are not good. Or you'll be marked by devastation and self-loathing because you'll feel like you'll never be good enough. 
and you can't figure out how to be good enough. So you're either going to be insecure and anxious, proud, or devastated, or you're going to go through all three of these at different phases of your life over and over. See, if Jesus didn't actually come, if the story of Christmas is just a wonderful legend, God, gift, baby, all of that is just a great make-believe story, if it's just that, then we have no hope. But what John is saying here is we saw him with our eyes. We heard him with our ears. We touched him with our hands. He's being emphatic here. He's not making a conversation here, but he's almost making this legal uh, deposition saying, listen, I swear to you, I saw this. I saw Jesus do this. I saw Jesus rise from the dead. I saw him perform miracles. John is saying, this isn't just a nice story about Jesus. This has really happened. We really saw him. He really lived. He really died. He really rose from the dead. He is really God who has come. He's not just a wonderful teacher out there. He's not just a good role model. He's not a mystery or a legend that tells us how to live. The gospel is not that Jesus comes to earth, tells us how to live then we live a good life and then God owes us a blessing the gospel is that Jesus came to earth lived the life we should have lived died the death we should have died and when we believe in him we are accepted and we live a life of grateful joy to him friends the gospel says that we are saved by grace and grace alone in other words if these things did not happen then our hope is in how well we perform If Christmas is just a nice legend, if Christmas is just a nice story, we're on our own. If these things didn't happen, if these are just parables, what you're saying is you think you can make it all by yourself. That if you try hard enough, God will accept you. But if Christmas is true, and John says that he's an eyewitness of this, then you can can know this morning that you are saved by grace and grace alone. You can know that it is by believing in him that you have been received and accepted into the family of God. Christmas means salvation by grace. Number two, Christmas means fellowship with God. Look at verse three. What we have seen, what we have heard, we also declare to you so that you may have fellowship along with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. In other words, the doctrine of Christmas or the doctrine of incarnation means that, friends, that now you and I have fellowship, relationship with God. We're being told that it's not enough to simply believe in God. It's not enough simply to obey God. Christmas means that God has gone to infinite lengths to come near you so that you and I can have a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus that you can call on him anytime, anywhere, any place, and know that you have a father that hears you and works on your behalf for his glory and your good. God is not simply content to be a concept to be believed in or something that will warm your heart. He's not even content to simply be a powerful force that you will bow down to because he became human. And one of the reasons is so that we could have intimacy with him fellowship with him. I'm not the only one in this room that's ever stood outside and tried to look at the sun and see if I could see the sun. And I don't need you to raise your hands, but I'll just be honest saying I've done that. But if you've ever tried to look at the sun to see what it looks like, you won't be able to see it. At best, it's a blur. Its glory and majesty will be too great for your eyes. It will overwhelm you, and at best, it's a blur. At worst, it will burn your retina and make you blind. (laughs) Therefore, if you really want to see the glory of the sun, you need a filter. You need something between you and the sun that will enable you to see the flames bursting on the surface, the sunspots, the eruptions that take place on the star. If you want to see the glory of the sun, you can't just directly look at it. You need to look at it through something. You can't just see the glory of the sun on your own. And in the same way, you cannot see the glory of God on your own. Earlier this morning, we sang the song, Hark the Herald, angels sing, and there's a line in that second verse that goes like this, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Charles Wesley, who wrote that song, didn't say that because God is veiled in flesh, we can't see the Godhead. 
He didn't say veiled in flesh, the God had hidden. He said veiled in flesh, the God had seen. Because God has come in the human form, we can see glory which otherwise would just overwhelm us. You remember Moses in the Old Testament, he asked God, God, show me your glory. And God said, if I show you my glory, it will kill you. It will destroy you. It will burn the retina of your soul. It will destroy you. But John John 1 says, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and friends, we beheld his glory. We beheld his glory. See, what does that mean? That means when you open scripture and you read the gospels and you see Jesus there, you're seeing God in the human form. It's almost like this filter that you can see God. You see his love, you see his holiness, you see his humility, you see his brilliance, you see his majesty, you see his wisdom, you see his compassion, you see his grace, you see his beauty. All the attributes of God that you know about. God says, I can't show you my glory directly, but in Jesus, you can come near. In Jesus, you can draw near. You can come near intellectually because you can understand, you can grasp him. See, if Jesus Christ is actually God coming in the flesh, you're going to know much more about God. He's going to be graspable. He's going to be someone that you can relate to. You're going to see him weep. You're going to see him upset. You're going to see him cast down. You're going to see him exalted. If Jesus is who he says he is, we have this 500-page autobiography from God, in a sense. And our understanding will be vastly more personal and specific than any philosophy or religion could ever give us. Friends, look at what God has done to know you personally. If the Son of God would come all the way to become a real person to you, don't you think the Holy Spirit will do anything in his power to make Jesus a real person to you in your heart? Christmas is an invitation to fellowship. Christmas is an invitation to know Jesus personally. Christmas is an invitation by God to say, look, I've done, look what I've done to come near you. God went to infinite lengths to come near you, to get close to you so that you can know him personally. God went to infinite lengths. He lost his glory. He lost everything. He lost his life so that you can know him. But there's a challenge there. You must be willing to go great lengths to go close to God. It's not enough simply to believe in him. See, many of us know that there are things in our lives that displease God. That's why we're not close to him. Many of us aren't taking the time to even learn how to pray. And Christmas means that God came near to you. God wants to be close to you. Daniel Steele is this old, dead English pastor, and he wrote this about his prayer life with Jesus. He said, almost every week, almost every day, the pressure of God's great love comes on my heart in such a measure as to make my whole being, soul, body, groan with this unimaginable joy. God has unlocked every apartment of my being and filled and flooded them with the light of his radiant presence. The spot spot before untouched has been reached and all of its filthiness has melted in the presence of Jesus who is altogether lovely. This is a man describing his prayer life. Is that how you and I describe our prayer life? Probably not. It's because if you and I want to get close to Jesus, There needs to be time that's put in. There needs to be effort that's put in. There needs to be saying, Jesus, you are the center of my life. I want to honor you with my choices. I want to honor you with my words. I want to honor you with my time. Jesus, what do you desire from me? There's this longing to say, Jesus, I don't want to just simply go through the motions of life living for myself. Jesus, what do you want from me? Jesus, what do you desire from me? How do I bring, use this life that you've given me for 60, 70 years, 80 years maybe, and how do I bring glory to you, knowing that you have loved me, saved me, redeemed me, how do I draw near to you? So Christmas is a challenge. Christmas means salvation by grace and grace alone. Christmas means you and I get to fellowship with God. Third thing, Christmas makes you relational. See, Christmas imprints on us this attitude about relationships. Jesus says, I want fellowship with you. 
See, the test that you know what Christmas is about is that you become desirous of intimate relationships with other people and you become better at getting to know them because the incarnation is the secret of good personal relationships. When two people are completely different culturally, linguistically, how are they going to have a relationship? Someone has to learn the other person's language. Someone has to speak in a broken dialect. Someone has to become vulnerable and weak. See, if you enter into another person's world, you become weak. The other person keeps the power, but then you have relationship. See, if you follow the way of Jesus, you'll say, I'll work not so much on being understood as much as understanding others. I work so much, I work so much not on getting my needs met, but on seeing how I can be a blessing to others. I'll work on entering his world or her world and giving that person what they consider love, not what I consider love. Christmas, if it's imprinted on you, if you see what Jesus has done, is going to make you unbelievably good at relationships with other people. Christmas means you're saved by grace alone. It means you're brought into fellowship with God. And because of that fellowship, you have genuine relationship with others. And finally, Christmas means joy. It means joy. The last verse, the last phrase of verse 4. John says this, I'm writing all this about the incarnation. I'm writing all this about Christmas so that your joy would be complete. John says, I want you to have fellowship with us. I want you to believe what we're saying. I want you to understand the doctrine of the incarnation, the doctrine that Christ came in this world. I want you to be united in community. I want us to be united in belief. And then he says, I'm doing all this. Why? So that my joy will be complete. He doesn't say, hey, listen, I need your lives to be okay so that I can have any joy at all. He's already got joy. He says, you need to get your act together for my joy to be complete. There's balance there. He's got a joy no matter what they do. See, Christmas gives you a certain type of joy that isn't affected by the circumstances of life. It's a joy that's there no matter what goes on, no matter what happens in your life. Before, we moved, before I moved to Dallas, I served as a chaplain in a hospital in Tulsa. And I think I've shared this story before, but one of the first days I went to, on rotations visiting patients I met this lady who came, I walked in and she said, and I walked in and I said, hey, how can I pray for you? And we got to start talking and she started sharing about her life and her children and grandchildren and all this stuff. And she's been diagnosed with cancer with a certain amount of time left to live. And I knew that she's got a certain amount of time left to live. And as she talked, we talked for a, a while and then finally at the end said, how, I, how can I pray for you? And she said, you know what, Sam? You can pray for me. If Jesus heals me, I get to live a little longer. If Jesus doesn't heal me, I get to see my Savior. Incredible joy in the midst of hardships and difficulties and circumstances. How does she get that? By a deep abiding relationship with Jesus. And here am I complaining about traffic on 75, getting angry about the little things of life. And here's this woman that knows she's got just a few days left to live and she's, her joy is complete. See, Christmas, if you really grasp it, gives you joy that no matter how bad things are on the surface, no matter how bad circumstances may be, the joy is always there. It keeps you green, it keeps you fresh. After all, Jesus has saved me. Jesus has redeemed me. God has opened the doors of heaven and invited me to be a part of his family. The kingdom is coming. I am part of the kingdom. Come hell or high water, there's joy there. There's joy. But on the other hand, let me close with this. John says, I cannot have joy unless you believe. What does that mean? And can I challenge you with this this Christmas season? Because many of us are afraid to enmesh ourselves into the lives of other people. Because we can't stand the idea of tying our hearts to other people because we know other people will hurt us. If they're unhappy, we're unhappy. And so what we do is we pull back. We withdraw. 
We say we don't have any mental capacity for them. We don't have any energy for them. We don't get involved in the lives of other people. But Christmas means, friends, that God got himself involved in the mess of your lives. God stuck himself into your life. And if he was willing to do that, and he was willing to do that in a major way, he was weeping. He came in. He fell. He had nails on his hands. He was beaten on his back. He had thorns placed on his head. And he was willing to get into the mess of your life. It says you can get involved in the mess of all people's, other people's lives. It says you can love them even if they're unlovable because Jesus loved you when you were unlovable. It says you can offer them grace because Jesus offered you grace. It says you could offer you compassion because Jesus offers you compassion. It means you can go the extra mile for someone because Jesus went the extra mile for you. See, here's the great thing about this joy that comes from God. It's an unspeakable joy. It's a joy that cannot go out, and it will give you freedom to get involved in the lives of other people. Christmas almost frees you to be emotional. It makes you realize that the emotion of grief is not going to take you all the way down because you have a supernatural joy that comes from Jesus. Can I invite you for a moment just to be in awe and wonder. In wonder that God doesn't say, hey, figure out your salvation on your own, but that you are saved by grace and grace alone. In wonder that the infinite God of the universe who made everything that we see says, I want to know you and be in relationship with you. In wonder that God empowers us to love those who are unlovable because Jesus first loved us and wonder that because God is with us, we can have joy. Regardless of circumstances or situations, we can have supernatural joy. Would you this morning be captivated by the wonder of Jesus? Would you be captivated by the love of your Savior? Would you be captivated by the lengths that God would go?